If you like what you're hearing on the phillytech.org netcast network, please consider supporting the network with a small monthly donation via patreon.com slash phillytechorg. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash p-h-i-l-l-y-t-e-c-h-o-r-g. And thank you in advance. You're listening to The Interview Show with Seth Goldstein on the phillytech.org netcast network. Thank you to our sponsors, wistia.com, Zoho Mail, and getflywheel.com. We are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the interview show. I am Seth, your host. I'm here with Steve Lubitkin, right? Close Does it, <laughs> where, how, how do you say it? Lubetkin. Lubetkin. Sorry, I should know how to say that because we've been friends for how many years now? Uh, like, it's probably a dozen at least. Probably a dozen years now. So, I, so now Steve is a professional podcaster and media and journalist and um, all-around great guy. He has a new book out, The Business of Podcasting. Thank you. And I just happen to have a copy of it with me, so. That's very convenient. And um, he also helps businesses of all sizes with their podcasting endeavors. And uh, as you can see, he has a very good image on the screen because my is him, of course, no. But I'm um, like, the lighting's nice, you know, works perfectly. So he obviously knows what he's talking about. So Steve, tell me a little bit about you and your background. Well, I uh, actually like to tell people, Seth, that I got started in podcasting as a teenager, even though when you look at me, that was a long time ago. Uh -huh. um, I, as a teenager, got bitten by the radio bug. I had the opportunity to spend an afternoon in a radio studio, Ooh, fun. A military base where my dad worked, um, where they actually taught members of the military how to be radio DJs. And I spent oh, that's cool. learning how to DJ and you know, queue up records and play commercials and things. And I was absolutely smitten with that. And from that moment on, I wanted to be on the radio. And, and, you, and you have the voice for it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so, so I actually went home and uh, set up a little studio in my basement uh, with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, one of which you can see over my shoulder in the background. Mm -hmm. um, I keep that as a relic because I've just finished digitizing all of my open reel tapes. Oh, wow. But those are fun. It was a uh, it was a long process, about 150 tapes, and they're now all digitized, so I can actually enjoy them and not worry about them deteriorating. But um, but I would make these pretend radio shows using the tape recorder and a microphone and a record player turntable, and uh, then play them for my best friend. So I had an audience of one for my uh, podcast. We just didn't know they were podcasts at the time, and so yeah. fast forward, um, I, I went to college and worked in college radio, and then I worked in commercial radio. Uh, for about five years after that, starting out as a production engineer and then uh, moving into news, announcing and reporting. And mm, very cool. Other stuff. And um, so when I left radio and print journalism, I went into corporate communications and public relations. The natural, the natural progression that usually happens. It, it typically happens because you can, uh, you can either be on the radio or you can buy groceries, but you usually can't do both. Mm -hmm. uh, the economics just work against you. Um, so I spent about 30 years in corporate communications positions of increasing responsibility, but I always used the uh, tools and skills that I learned in broadcasting to try to uh, promote the clients that I was working with uh, in the PR field. So I was always carrying a little cassette recorder with me and taping audio of people at there the you go. events mm -hmm. and then feeding it over the phone line. Some people might be old enough to remember when we plugged cassette recorders into telephone lines. Uh, using a patch cable that had alligator clips on the end, two little alligator clips. Oh, wow. You unscrewed, th this goes back a long ways because you unscrewed wow. the mouthpiece of a payphone. Oh, wow. <laughs> go find one of those today, right? Actually, there's one in Central Park in Doylestown. I don't think it works, go. though. So try and unscrew the mouthpiece, and inside you'll find a little disc. Mi it's a carbon disc microphone, which can re be removed, and underneath it there are two little prongs. And so you clip the alligator clips on those two little prongs, from the patch cable and you can feed audio out of a cassette recorder's earphone jack over the phone back to the radio station and someone at the other end can record it on a machine there and get it on the air 
That's how we used to do. It. Now today, wow, that's a hack. That is a hack. You know, today it's a heck of a lot easier. We have um, digital audio that we can feed over Wi-Fi connections, and I'm even looking at a uh, handheld digital audio recorder that has Wi-Fi built in. So that oh, you that's can cool. Not only control it from your smartphone, but you can also upload the audio from it to the cloud without removing the SD card from. The oh, device. I want. So, uh, you know, there's the, the the technology has advanced a lot. So flash forward to 2004 when I was exiting the corporate world, um, you know, I got to a point in my career where many people do where uh, the corporate world doesn't want you anymore because you're too mm -hmm. expensive and I uh, uh, went out on my own. And my initial thought was, frankly, to continue doing public relations mm -hmm. to be a, a PR counselor on my own. It's a very challenging thing to do. There's a lot of big agencies that you're competing with, and it's a, it's a very competitive environment. I really needed something to uh, distinguish and differentiate myself. And at the time I was aware of blogging and what we then called new media, we now call social media, but it was my wife who really focused me on podcasting. She heard an uh, NPR report on podcasting mm -hmm. very early on, it was probably early 2005. And wow. said, you know, with your radio stuff, you really should be listening to this. So I started listening to podcasts and what I realized immediately was this is a great venue for corporations and organizations to promote their expertise and their knowledge, but it has to sound like it was produced by NPR. It has to sound yes. like broadcast quality. And I was hearing a lot of amateur stuff that reminded me, frankly, of when I was in college radio. And a lot of us, when we were learning radio, you know, we're smitten with the uh, technology. We're smitten with the, you know, here's the microphone, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. You know, I bring the microphone in, I talk about the microphone. No one cares about what microphone you're using. So what they care yeah. about is what you deliver them some expertise about something. Mm -hmm, absolutely. The large number of corporations, it needed to sound really, really good. And uh, so I had to learn all the skills that I learned back in the day all over again, because analog recording mm -hmm. and editing skills and, you know, plugging alligator clips into a payphone just don't work in the new environment. So I had to yeah, learn. They don't the exist. Yeah, Digital absolutely. Recording and editing the software, the workflow. But once I got that down, it was fairly simple and quick to get people excited about podcasts. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so for the past uh, almost 11 years, I've been uh, producing wow. podcast content. Not so much that I before it was myself. cool. Yeah, before exactly. Was... Not so much interested in hearing myself talk. I can I can do that. I've done it. And you're but good at it. What interests me <laughs> most is producing really good quality content mm -hmm. for clients. And that's yeah. what I've been doing is, is producing podcasts for a, a bunch of large organizations and they uh, use it to demonstrate that they are experts in their field. Good. So, so it's PR mixed with podcasting mixed with everything. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Very cool. So you're now venturing the video from what I hear. Yeah. So video came about fairly quickly. Once I got into doing audio and most of the business was audio in the mm -hmm. first couple of years, people started saying, should we be doing video? Because YouTube had suddenly become, you know, popular. Mm -hmm. We're talking 2005, 2006. People had a bigger awareness of it. And, you know, I frankly didn't have the video equipment. And I was worried about that. My wife says to me, what's keeping you awake at night about the business? And I said, to tell you the truth, I'm a little concerned that, you know, the call is going to come one morning saying, we need you to shoot video today. And I'm not going to have a camera, I'm going to be scrambling. She said, well, look, go out and, you know, price some used equipment. And I did. And you have a good wife. I have a wonderful mm -hmm. wife. And uh, I dedicated the book to her and to my two daughters. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the, the funny thing was, you know, I'm not a build it and they will come kind of guy. I've seen a lot of businesses go down the drain, buying stuff before they have the business to justify mm -hmm. the investment. So I was holding off as long as I could, but people were starting to ask for it and I needed to get the gear. As luck would have it, a good friend of mine was retiring <laughs> and uh, closing down his side business, which was producing wedding and bar mitzvah videos. Perfect. And I called him up and said, what are you doing with your cameras? And he said, well, I'm thinking of selling them. And I said, I'll be over tonight. And I literally went to his house that night, bought all of his equipment, crossed my fingers while I was writing the check. And then um, as luck would have it, within about a week and a half, I had the job that paid for the equipment. And I said, okay, mm -hmm. we dodged that bullet. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see what else we can do. And we've been doing a video of all kinds, primarily seminar and conference videos, mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, we also do some documentary style videos and tribute videos. I'm working on a video that's going to be shown at a conference for um, a large organization a little bit later this month. Um, I do testimonial videos for different organizations where, you know, we go out and interview people. The other piece of it is um, I've taken on a couple of journalism clients, some news oh. content websites where um, I am producing content for them. So for njspotlight.com, uh, we produce a lot of their conference videos. They do some roundtables on public policy issues. Oh, very cool. We produce their uh, seminar videos, but we've also done some news reporting for them. We're actually hmm. I'm the reporter out in the field, interviewing people, shooting the B-roll, and doing the stand-up reports on site. As That's pretty were, cool. You know, working for a TV network. Um, you know, That's it, fun. It satisfies that creative urge, you know, yeah. to uh, actually report on the news. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been an interesting journey, and uh, about a year and a half ago, Donna Papacosta, who is a another podcasting pioneer like myself, uh, she started doing podcasting for clients up in Toronto, Canada, oh, about, a, about right about the same time that I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, she contacted me and said, you know, we really should write a book. And I have this idea for a book, uh, but we should write it together because we're both doing it kind of the same way. And I said, yeah, I mean, it makes sense because, you know, if you don't have a book, everyone asks, do you have a book? Do you have well, a book? Do you have a book? Do you have a book? Do you have a book? And like you're, now you have a book. Well, you know, it's a funny, funny story. A, a few years ago, I was invited to appear on a panel at a conference, and it was a really big, high-profile panel. Um, I was probably like the C or the D-list uh, <laughs> uh The A, B, and C people couldn't do it, so they came to me. Um, but it was actually Inc. Magazine's leadership conference. Ooh, was, that's a good one. A big one. It was down in Dallas, Texas. It was a social media panel. Um, and I was asked to be on it to talk about podcasting. And when they sent me the information about travel arrangements and everything else, in the materials they sent me, it says, if you have a book, we're going to have an answer. Uh, I, I did exactly what you just did. <laughs> yeah, said, yeah, I'm working on one, but it's not ready book. yet. They said, ship us your book and we'll even have a book signing for you. And I went, oh, oh man, I can't get a book written in two weeks. So um, I'm hoping you can, that I'll get but another, not a good quality one, but you could get one in two weeks, but not a very good one. I'm hoping I'll get a, another invitation to a conference like that so I can ship the books and, and, and do the book signing. But we're doing we're doing some appearances. I've been at a couple of podcasting conferences. As you know, we were Podcast at Philly. Philly. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Podcast. Absolutely. And celebrating its 10th year next year. So we're yeah, all Mazel really tov. happy about that. Um, this past Saturday, I was at the Collingswood, New Jersey Book Festival, oh, which that was good. is held every year. I think this was like the 13th year. Um, and we did very well. We met a lot of people. We sold a few books and, uh, you know, got out there with the with the book publishing world. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a fun journey. And, uh, and it was self-published too, right? Self-published, but uh, we... No, we, wait, 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 not, let's not knock that. No, no. Self-publishing is actually sometimes harder. You know, you, well, getting a deal is hard for, but then self-publishing, you got to do everything. Exactly. I'll be honest with you. I've talked to authors who have been successful going the other route where they actually have engaged an agent and gotten mm. a mainstream traditional publisher. And I really find they do almost all of the same things that we have to do as self-published authors. The only difference is that someone else is taking another piece of it for yeah. you know, the publishing end of it. They don't get a lot of marketing support unless you're Stephen King you know, or somebody at that well, level. Well, that, that you can sneeze and get coverage. You, know, you, you don't get much, you don't mm -hmm. get much marketing support. So really, we, we evaluated looking for an agent and looking for a publisher. And we basically decided it didn't make a lot of sense. And with Amazon nowadays, I mean, they, have, they have that and it's just like done. Uh, you know, this, this is a trade paperback book. It's 165 pages. It's bound beautifully. It looks wonderful. Um, and I think it's a great value. So yeah. uh, I'm happy. And it's also it's also print on demand, right? Yeah, it's absolutely print on demand. So there's no inventory for people to worry about. The downside of that, frankly, is that the mainstream bookstores uh, don't want to do book signings with authors of those kind of books because uh, they can't order them and then return them if they don't sell. So you know yeah. you have you have that kind of a fight in the industry. But you know with the the ubiquitousness of social media, oh yeah, a lot of. A lot of different ways we can sell the book, even as I speak to you now. Exactly. So where can people go to get the book? If you want well, to buy they it? can certainly buy it on Amazon. Um, I'll give you a, a, an easy short link. It's bit.ly forward slash bizpod amazon one. 
BizPod, Amazon One with Bitly before it. With Bitly before it. And that will take you right to the page for the book. You can either order an Amazon Kindle version of the book. Or Which you I can, got. Or you can order the trade paper. Thank you for buying that. Yeah, um, <laughs> like he said, I have a book. I'm like, bought? I'll be happy but to. Was, see, see, yeah, Steve's a good friend. So I'm like, you know, and I see friends, you know. I just bought Gabriel Weinberg's, you know, the CEO of DuckDuckGo's book. It's just because Philly boy, you know, you're a Philly boy, you know, we've got to support each other, so. Much appreciated. So, uh, so Amazon is one place, and uh, of course, uh, we're selling the book as well. Um, people can come to my website if they go to uh, beingthemedia.com, which is where my website is. On the uh, right-hand sidebar, you'll see information for ordering the book there. Awesome. Well, Steve, where can they find you online? How about Twitter? Oh, I'm uh, podcast Steve on Twitter. And you've probably come across him a few times. He's kind of ubiquitous yeah. with Twitter. I've, I've been on uh, Twitter since uh, 2007. Mm -hmm. And um, online on uh, on the net, again, beingthemedia.com is the main website. We also have a the news content website is statebroadcastnews.com. That's where Ooh. a lot of the news content we produce for our news, news gathering clients. Awesome. Well, Steve, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, Seth. And... That's been the show, obviously. And if you want to support the show, please go to patreon.com slash org and throw some money at us and we can bring more great people on like Steve. Thanks a lot. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.